Sure. Really? Just go to the BBC website and look for Lockdown Learning. Good morning, welcome to Breakfast with Rachel Burden and Charlie Stay. Our headlines today, the row over COVID vaccines and the Irish border. The European Union initially says it will control the movement of jabs between the Republic and Northern Ireland, but then backtracks hours later. Prime Minister. Good morning, it's Saturday the 30th of January. Our top story, threats to impose controls on the movement of coronavirus vaccines across the Irish border were reversed by officials in Brussels late last night after an outcry from politicians in both the UK and Europe. On Friday, the EU appeared to undermine a key part of the Brexit agreement when they said they could introduce restrictions within the island of Ireland to stop vaccines being exported to the UK. Well, they now say that was a mistake and we'll release some more details of their plans later. Our Ireland correspondent Chris Page has more. The Irish border was probably the most serious obstacle on the road to Brexit. The UK and the EU believed keeping it open was vital for the peace process in Northern Ireland. The solution was to put in place some checks on goods arriving into Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. That meant no controls on the frontier with the Irish Republic. Yesterday, Brussels said it would trigger an emergency clause in that agreement known as Article 16. It allows parts of the deal to be overridden in exceptional circumstances. EU states are getting powers to block COVID vaccines from being exported. The European Commission believed Northern Ireland could be used as a back door to bring doses into Britain. I understand, uh, this is what uh, I hear uh, uh, from the European Commission that there was an accident. The accident or the mishap has been repaired uh, and I think this is important. But again, uh, this is not a hostile act against third countries or territories. All parties in Northern Ireland strongly criticised the Commission. Boris Johnson and the Irish Prime Minister Michal Martin made their strong concerns known. The EU announced it wouldn't use the emergency clause after all, but unionists weren't impressed. What the EU did in, first of all, wanting to implement Article 16 uh, and override parts of the protocol was to demonstrate that its whole approach to Northern Ireland has been based on a hypocrisy and a falsehood for the last number of years. A big diplomatic crisis has been avoided, but the events may have implications for sensitive political relationships in Belfast, London and Brussels. Chris Page, BBC News, Belfast. Well, let's speak now to our political correspondent, Leila Nathu, who's in a London newsroom. It's a little convoluted, this one, to say the least, Leila, but if anything was ever going to challenge uh, the sensitivities of the border between uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland on the island of Ireland, then this pandemic was surely going to be that. Yeah, it's an extraordinary collision, isn't it, Charlie, between Brexit and the coronavirus pandemic, adding an extra layer to what was already quite a serious situation for the EU in terms of its vaccine rollout programme. But I think, you know, this does have implications for the post-Brexit relationship between the UK and the EU because the EU has showed itself apparently prepared to blow up the key part of the Brexit deal that it spent warning all along throughout the negotiations was the crucial issue, no hard border between uh, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And just a few weeks into the new relationship with the UK, the EU has apparently pulled the trigger on this emergency clause saying that, look, our vaccine rollout programme is actually more important and we can't risk this potential backdoor. I think there is relief now across the board in across the island of Ireland in the UK too that this actually hasn't come to pass that the EU have backtracked but it will leave a lasting impression and lasting concerns that the EU was prepared to act in this way and so quickly and it will raise questions as to if the EU will act again in this way and where the relationship goes from here so I think that it will leave the UK sort of with some trepidation really about the, how the coming months and the early stages of the post-Brexit relationship with the EU will unfold. Leila, thank you. The Prime Minister has published an open letter leading to fears that children could pay a heavy price in this pandemic. Brown and Jeffries, BBC News. France has announced it will close 
its borders to non-EU travellers as coronavirus infections remain high. From Sunday, all but essential travel from outside of the European Union will be banned and testing requirements from inside the EU will also be tightened. The new restrictions will affect the UK, but not hauliers transporting goods across the border. Pandemic. They're also expected to visit a food market linked to one of the first cluster of cases. And I should put in a, a time check here in order that we stop saying those things and say something very different. Yes, there I thought go. we were going to say Ten something very nine. different, but actually we're not. We're going to continue the theme. <laughs> There's a moment, I'll, I'll explain why I said that then, because I thought for a moment, I thought we were going to see pictures of a duck that can surf. Mm. What a shame. But we're not, but we're not going to see it, so, so that moment has passed. Well, we all need something that just takes us away from the things we're talking about all the time. But we're going back to it now at eight minutes past nine. The UK reached, of course, that really grim milestone this week when COVID deaths topped 100,000 people had their first dose in the latest 24-hour period. Now, that takes the overall number of people who've had their first jab to more than 7.8 million. Making education more accessible than ever, with learning for every child of every age group, every day of the week, online, on iPlayer, and now on website. And look for lockdown learning. Hello, good afternoon. The European Union is facing criticism from politicians across the UK over its now abandoned plan to override the post-Brexit withdrawal treaty to impose export controls from the EU to Northern Ireland as part of efforts to control the export of coronavirus vaccines. Northern Ireland's First Minister, Arlene Foster, called it an incredible act of hostility towards those of us in Northern Ireland. The plans had been part of the EU's new export controls on vaccines to combat delivery shortfalls. Well, following talks with Boris Johnson, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen tweeted that the UK and the EU had agreed on the principle that there should not be restrictions on the export of vaccines by companies where they're fulfilling contractual responsibilities. And today, the World Health Organization has criticized the EU's announcement of export controls on vaccines produced within the bloc, saying such measures risk prolonging the pandemic. Well, our political correspondent Leila Nafu reports. How to avoid border checks between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic was the issue that dominated the Brexit negotiations. But last night, the prospect of a hard border on the island was raised again after the EU activated an emergency provision in the Brexit deal in frustration over the pace of its vaccine rollout. So it's an absolutely incredible act of hostility towards those of us in Northern Ireland. It was nothing to do with uh, making sure that Northern Ireland uh, was in a peaceful state and all to do with the European Union's um, vaccine embarrassment and mismanagement. The Prime Minister now needs to act very quickly to deal with the real trade flows that are being disrupted between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The EU announced controls of exports of vaccines produced in the bloc and wanted to stop any doses entering Northern Ireland as a back route into the UK. But the Commission quickly reversed its decision after condemnation from Westminster, Belfast and Dublin. There's a joint duty of care. We need to apply that rigorously in Northern Ireland and we need to have that spirit of cooperation uh, you know, across the uh, new relationship that we've got with our EU uh, friends and partners. The EU is scrambling to secure vaccines for its member states. It's in a dispute with the firm AstraZeneca about whether doses should be diverted from the UK to the continent to meet commitments already made. Late last night, the European Commission's president, Ursula von der Leyen, said she'd had a constructive conversation with Boris Johnson and they'd agreed there would be no export restrictions when companies were fulfilling contractual responsibilities. Downing Street said last night that the Prime Minister had grave concerns about the potential impact of the EU's actions, but ministers maintain they are confident in the UK's vaccine supplies. Number 10 is yet to comment on the EU's reversal over Northern Ireland. But this episode risks souring relations, fueling suspicion of Brussels and Westminster and raising concerns about how the EU may behave in the future if its interests are threatened. 
Leila Nafu, BBC News. Well, Alexander Stubb is former Prime Minister of Finland. And it's a sign of these desperate times that in the space of just a few hours last night, the EU threatened to do the one thing they'd spent years warning against, imposing new border controls in Ireland and overriding the Brexit deal to do it. And then hours later, they were forced to backtrack in the face of a rare display of unity between all parties in Belfast, Dublin and London. Lest this seems like an obscure argument about treaties and protocols, let's remember why the stakes are so high. You are currently three to four times more likely to get a vaccine if you live north rather than south of the Irish border. We can talk first to our Brussels correspondent, Kevin Connolly, and easy to forget why anger is so high in the EU, Kevin, isn't it, at this time? That's right, Nick. There's been very, very strong language in various parts of the EU. The Croatian Prime Minister Andrzej Plenkovic talked about the hijacking of vaccines. Uh, Didier Renders, one of the European commissioners, talked yesterday about the possibility of a vaccine war. And for the European Commission in particular, the political stakes here are enormously high. It insisted on being front and centre in the vaccine race, taking over those responsibilities from the governments of individual member states. Now, the last thing that the European Commission can risk is the possibility that those member states might start to think, you know what, we could have done a better job of this ourselves as a French or a German government. You have elections in the Netherlands pretty soon, you have elections in Germany in September and in France in the spring of next year. I would say that in all of those elections, there's a pretty good chance that the relative success of the EU in the vaccination programme is going to be a pretty big issue. And for the European Commission, they simply can't for afford for it to look like a failure when it is very much their choice to have it as their responsibility. We heard you in the news bulletin, Kevin, trying to parse the language in a tweet from the president of the European Commission. You think she may be calling off the vaccine war if one was ever planned, do you? Certainly winding it down. It's not clear, Nick, that they were really ever planning a vaccine war where there'd be some guy with a clipboard from the Belgian government at the gates of the Pfizer factory saying this shipment cannot go to Dover. We don't know that they were ever really planning to do that. They were sort of invoking powers which sort of allowed them to do that. You know, there's a huge problem with diplomacy by Twitter. Imagine what the Treaty of Versailles would have looked like if they'd had to boil it down to 140 characters and tweet it in the middle of the night. But Ursula von der Leyen did say that after a conversation with Boris Johnson that the, uh, there would be no problem with, uh, with vaccines being transported so that contractual obligations could be fulfilled. That feels to me as though it winds down a perceived threat at least, but we do need them to come out with more detail and a, a, a more rounded and, and way of expressing all of this, which allows us to ask them questions about exactly what they do mean. But that's the feeling, I think, of that midnight tweet. Kevin Connolly in Brussels, thank you very much indeed. Well, one of those who was manning the phones last night is a former Northern Ireland secretary who retains a deep interest in what happens there. Julian Smith, the Conservative MP, joins us on the line. Good morning to you. Just explain to people who don't follow the details of these articles and protocols and treaties, why the passion, why the anger last night? Well, Nick, the protocol um, was the centre of years of Brexit debate where... Um, all sides were trying to protect the Good Friday Agreement and the border between uh, North and, and South in Ireland. And uh, uh, years had been spent trying to ensure that goods would flow freely uh, um, and that there would be no hard border. And last night, uh, the EU pulled the emergency cord without following any of the processes that are in the protocol to if one side wants to uh, suspend it. Uh, and they did that. Uh, they did that, in my view, with, uh, out uh, anywhere near the level of understanding of the Good Friday of Agreement, of the sensitivities of uh, the situation in Northern Ireland. Um, and it was an almost sort of Trumpian act. I'm very pleased that um, they've changed their mind. But, I, you know, clearly there's a 
a major issue for them with vaccines, but that does not excuse them uh, from what they did last night. An almost Trumpian act. Do you agree, do you, with the DUP, who, for example, Nigel Dodds, told Newsnight last night that this was a hostile act. It was based on a hypocrisy and a falsehood in the EU's position for several years, he said, over the future of Northern Ireland. Well, I, I'm not sure if I uh, subscribe to that analysis. What, what, what I think happened was that some people deep in the bowels of the Commission trying to deal with one challenge, the vaccine challenge, the very difficult position that they find themselves in on vaccines, uh, then uh, did not think and had not read and had not understand either stood either the Good Friday Agreement, the duty of care that both the EU and Great Britain now have to protect the border with north and south on the island of Ireland, nor had whoever was coming up with uh, the uh, policy uh, yesterday looked at the rules in the protocol, which are to go through a whole political process before you end up uh, pulling that emergency cord. Now, you are not just a former Northern Ireland Secretary, you're a former Conservative Chief Whip. Does this not guarantee that the arguments about the Irish border, potentially leading to a referendum about a united Ireland uh, in a number of years, these are going to continue? The idea that the Irish border and the question of it has been settled is for the birds, isn't it? Because uh, uh, the reaction of Ireland, Ireland was active all uh, night last night. Um, in trying to fix this problem. They hadn't be, even been consulted before uh, the EU took this decision. Our own government, our own Prime Minister, Michael Gove, the civil service worked extremely hard to lower the temperature. And I think we did start to see a more practical uh, relationship emerging uh, and one that we now need to build on. And I think we need to build on that in the interest of uh, the union. Uh, we need to uh, build on that in order to support concerns, legitimate concerns that unionists have some unionists have in Northern Ireland around supermarket supply chains, etc. We need help from the EU in solving those. But above all, all of the frameworks that have been set up, all of the relationship opportunities that have been set up to get a much more mature relationship between the EU and the UK going forward have now to start working. Ironically, Nick, the person, one of the people working extremely hard to sort this problem out last night on behalf of the UK was the EU ambassador to London. The relationships are complex. We need to spend much, much more time, much, much more money and much, much more resource on getting this relationship right. The EU cocked up big time last night. Uh, but, you know, we all need to work in the interests of preserving Northern Ireland. It is not just a backdoor uh, for goods going to Britain. It is a very sensitive place. And we have a duty of care between the EU and the UK to preserve no hard border and stability in Northern Ireland. Julian Smith, thank you very much indeed. We'll be hearing from the First Minister of Northern Ireland at 10 past eight. And if anybody would like to take up Kevin Connolly's, Connolly's challenge of doing the Treaty of Versailles in 140 characters in a tweet, you know where we are today at bbc.co.uk or on Twitter. Dear Adler, many thanks. Well, we can talk now to Arlene Foster, Northern Ireland's First Minister. Good morning. Good morning, Martha. Do you welcome this change of heart, change of mind from the European Commission? Well, first of all, let me say, since the um, 2016 Brexit referendum, we have been treated to hyperbole about the border on the island of Ireland and how uh, the addition of even an extra camera on the road between Belfast and Dublin would have caused great difficulty. And yet 29 days since the protocol was put in place, they threatened... Uh, to, de to actually um, let the protocol bre breach happen, uh, to invoke Article 16, despite the fact that we in Northern Ireland have been dealing with trade disruption, uh, with an unfair and unworkable protocol, which was put in place to deal with demands from the European Union side. So it's an absolutely incredible act of hostility towards those of us in Northern Ireland. It was nothing to do with uh, making sure that Northern Ireland uh, was in a peaceful state and all to do with the European Union's um, vaccine embarrassment and mismanagement. It's absolutely you... disgraceful. And I have to say, the Prime Minister now needs to act very quickly to deal with the real trade flows that are being disrupted between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 
Do you um, buy the theory, I mean, it's been said by the Spanish foreign minister that um, that there was an accident. This is what I hear from the European Commission, another theory in some of the Irish newspapers saying that this was possibility, possibly somebody kind of lower down, a functionary not really understanding the implications of what they were doing. Well, there was always a skewed understanding of the Belfast Agreement uh, in the European Commission. That was the real difficulty behind uh, why the protocol came into being. Um, they said that they uh, wanted to protect trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and vice versa, but had scant regard for actually our main market, which is Great Britain. So we don't mind uh, disrupting trade within a sovereign country as long as we uh, continue the trade, the lesser trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. The protocol is based on a completely misunderstanding of the Belfast Agreement. And now... Um, it appears to me that the European Commission believe they can do with the protocol as they wish, but yet so, lecture, the, lecture the United Kingdom government that uh, it's, it's written in stone. So what would you like the Prime Minister to do to alleviate the kind of um, trade flow issues that you've described? Would you like him to trigger Article 16 himself? Uh, we have been asking the Prime Minister to deal with the flow problems uh, and indeed uh, since the 1st of January, we have been trying to manage, along with the government, the many, many difficulties that have arisen uh, between Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland. And there are actions he could take immediately, uh, because uh, at the moment, uh, what we're doing is all of the goods that come in and may have the possibility of going into the single market of Europe uh, then are being checked. And of course, most of the goods coming from Great Britain are going nowhere near the Republic of Ireland. They're staying in Northern Ireland uh, and therefore these checks should not be taking place. So there is action that the Prime Minister can take. Uh, we will be pushing him to take that action because I have to say, Martha, that actually there is great unrest and great tension within the community here in Northern Ireland. So this protocol that was meant to bring about uh, peace and harmony in Northern Ireland is doing quite the reverse. Really, that's interesting you say that. And I know there have been warnings from the um, Chief Constable from Police Service of Northern Ireland as well. But do you think that this could lead to increased security risks? I just think that there's a great deal of tension in Northern Ireland. I've communicated that to the Prime Minister and to Michael Gove that they need to act to deal with this issue. Because it is incredible that a sovereign country are putting up barriers for trade. Uh, between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I'll give you a very simple example. So a lot of people at this time of the year will be uh, ordering their seeds for their gardens uh, online. And uh, one of the largest uh, exporters of seeds right across the world has told people in Northern Ireland that they can no longer send seeds across from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. So it's obviously is causing a lot of everyday difficulties, but you seem to be stopping short of the idea of the Prime Minister uh, using Article 16, oh, no, which is something no. that some people in, in your party would like to see. But do, would no, you like no, him to I, use I that? No, I absolutely would like him to use Article 16. I'm simply saying up until now, we've been trying to deal with these issues on an uh, individual basis. But the protocol is unworkable. Let's be very clear about that. And we need to see it replaced because otherwise there is going to be real difficulties here in Northern Ireland. But if you uh, going to that um, stage of replacing the um, uh, the protocol altogether, that would be in breach of an international treaty, wouldn't it? Well, it didn't seem to bother the European Union yesterday when they breached the uh, treaty in terms of their embarrassment around their vaccine. Well, was procurement. it a breach, or were they just using a measure in in the protocol designed to be used in an emergency? But it was still part of the protocol, wasn't it? But you're talking about getting rid of the protocol altogether, as far as I understand. I'm it. talking about triggering Article 16, which, as you say, is part of the protocol to deal with the huge difficulties that there are. Uh, and I mean, if people don't understand uh, in Great Britain the difficulties, they should come here to Northern Ireland and realise that our trade has been fundamentally disrupted by this protocol. And that is simply not workable and is totally unfair for those of us who live in Northern Ireland. Where does all of this leave the constitutional status of Northern Ireland, do you think? There have been talk of um, a border poll, a poll on the, on the principle of United Ireland, which hasn't been um, on the agenda for, for many years. Um, the talk of younger voters and opinion polls supporting the idea of a United Ireland. Do you think that th 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 there are strains which question the, the constitutional status of Northern Ireland? 
Well, actually, the irony is uh, last year showed the strength of the United Kingdom through the COVID-19 response and the way in which we've been dealing with it across the United Kingdom. And actually, because of our membership of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland is leading the way in our vaccine programme. We have more people vaccinated in Northern Ireland than anywhere else in the United Kingdom per head of population. And we're very proud of that. Plus, uh, we had great support from Westminster in relation to our financial commitment. So actually, when people look at uh, our membership of the United Kingdom in a rational, logical way, they will choose the United Kingdom. And of course, and given this those issue vaccination of- rates, which you point out, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but given those vaccination rates, you know, I think we were quoting them earlier on in the programme, but around 10 percent in Northern Ireland, much lower in the Republic. Do you think mm-hmm. that if there is a surplus in the UK that um, vaccines should be uh, given to the Republic of Ireland? Well, I, I, I absolutely think we can help our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland because of their membership of the European Union. They have not been able to access uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine in the way that I'm sure they would have liked to if they had been a sovereign country. And I'm sure that we could have those conversations. But in having those conversations, we also need to recognise the unworkability of the protocol. And if Dublin uh, recognises that, then I think there is a real chance that we can deal with these issues. Arling Foster, First Minister in Northern Ireland, thank you so much for joining us.